it was supposed to be otherwise. And I've heard this from a lot of authors, but they have had a chance to have some significant downtime with people on Zoom. So that's been really, that's been to our advantage in some ways, because I mean, I would not have gotten the chance to, to hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Elizabeth's in our book group. I am proudly. And so is Anita. So let me, let me just quick, let people just chime in as we get going. Um, my name, uh, all of you know my name, Alice Hutchinson. We own Birds Books in Bethel, Connecticut. Um, we are not open, but we aren't entirely closed either. Well, hi, Jim Foreman. How are you? Um, we are doing online ordering, a lot of phone calling, a lot of curbside pickup. And we have configured the store so that you can walk in and it's touch free. Um, people are doing a lot of advanced ordering and doing touch free. Most bookstores are not completely open to wandering around because they'll say that everything is okay to touch, but we're not entirely sure that that's true. So we limit that and we kind of take everything and leave it aside for a while. So bookstores are operating the up. Uh, operating the best they can and we had a big advantage for two months that Amazon was not shipping books. Jimmy, do you need me to Jimmy, I'm gonna mute you for a minute while you get settled because it was getting kind of loud there. Y'all set? I can unmute. Yeah. You can just unmute yourself anytime. Um <clears throat> there's two or three others, but we're gonna get going. You good? All right. Neil, First of all, Neil, I just wanted to point out that outside my window is Mount Sunset Hill Road in Bethel, Connecticut. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. And it's real. Robert, you, Robert that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we have Maine, we have Mount Rainier. Okay. Books. Um, how many people in this group so far have read the book in advance? Oh, which one? You uh, we're talking about the escape artist first. So you've, you've had a chance to read it. I know Sandy and Jim, uh, Elizabeth, you're in my regular book group, but did you read this history book group? No, I have not read this, but I just bought uh, the copy uh, for me and my father-in-law and also a copy of Faster for my husband for Father's Day. Great. So he's very okay. excited. You're in good shape. Um, for those of you who don't know, our author, Neil Bascom, is a national award-winning New York Times best-selling author of a number of books, all nonfiction narratives, all focused on inspiring stories of adventure and achievement. His work has been translated into over 15 languages, featured in several documentaries, and option for major film and television projects. Born in Colorado, and I said it correctly, because I went to college there, and raised in St. Louis, he is the product of public school and lots of time playing hockey. He earned a double degree in economics and English literature at Miami University, Ohio, lived in Europe for several years as a journalist, London, Dublin, and Paris. That's enviable. <laughs> and worked as an editor at St. Martin's Press, New York. In, and in 2000, he started writing books full time. You're an avid skier, coffee drinker, hiker, and has happily settled in Philadelphia, unlike your background, with his family. If you're interested in how Neil researches and writes his books, there's an essay that provides a window into the madness on LitHub. And I have a, I'm going to put that in the chat. So for those of you who want to post any information, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see, excuse the phone, an icon for chat that should be there. Are you seeing it? Chat. I know. Yes. There's an icon yeah. for chat and it should pull up a screen to your right where you can add or subtract questions, links, anything you'd like. Um, the first book that we're going to talk about is The Escape Artist. Now, the first question that I have, and some of them were on your website, Neil, mm -hmm. um, 
I should be able to answer them then. I think you should be, <laughs> since you probably wrote both the questions and the answers, I'm sure. Uh, one of the questions that I have, and it's actually something that we've discussed in our bookstores, is World War II keeps getting a lot of focus. And I'm finding that a lot in the pandemic, people are reading a lot of World War stories, World War II stories, because they're accessible and they kind of have an arc for people making it through, particularly the Brits. Why did you pick World War I and how did you stumble on this story? So I came, I was, gosh, I, this has been a while now, four or five or six years ago. Um, I was looking, you know, for my next book project. And sometimes they, I, when I finish one book, I already have the idea. I know what I'm going to do next. And it's like, it's a sort of seamless transition. Uh, other times I have been so buried into a particular book and nothing sort of crossed my path. And so then it becomes a, a kind of hunt for ideas or areas where I want to write. And I'd always wanted to write an escape story. I think just I'm fascinated by escape stories uh, since I was young. Um, but I wasn't even thinking about it, but my, I have a editor at Scholastic. So all my books are published first as adult books. Uh, and then Scholastic Books publishes a young adult version, which is a, a sort of shor shorter, abbreviated. If an adult book is, let's say, 100,000 words, the young adult book is like 40,000 words, uh, a lot more pictures, photographs, graphics, etc. And so I'd always done my adult books first, and then, then Scholastic published the young adult. And so my Scholastic editor actually came to me and said, <clears throat> I'd really like you to write a, the, a book about, a young adult book about the, the great escape uh, in World War II. Uh, that, um, you know, Steve McQueen, the movie, it's, yep. you all acquainted. Um, and I wasn't terribly interested in writing that. I, I read uh, various books uh, about that escape. Um, it seemed like very well trod territory. Uh, other historians and writers had covered it, and there'd been movies and everything. So, but my editor did sort of pique my interest again about, okay, let's try to maybe find a, an escape story that uh, people don't know. And that's sort of equally fascinating. And so I began doing some research and going to the library, and, and I actually came across this book about uh, MI9. Uh, which was the British Escape and Evasion Service uh, in World War II. And in that sort of very large volume, there was this story about how MI9 started and about how some, there were lecturers from World War I who taught the art of escape. And many of those uh, veterans actually had escaped from this place called Holtzminden. And I thought that was intriguing. And so I, you know, this is how things go. Like you, you read something and then you, you follow it down various paths. Uh, and in this particular case, um, I read more about the escape at Holtzman in, in World War I and, and found out that it was actually the, you know, much bigger escape than the, the famous ones of World War II. Uh, and it had all these sort of different layers um, that, I found very intriguing. And so I'd never ventured into World War I territory, but I was glad to, to, to do so. And, you know, it's, it, was, it was pretty fascinating research. Anyone can chime in with an answer. Just put your hand up so we don't all speak at once. Um, and, uh, hi, hi, Rich, you're not actually Eileen. I see yep. on your name tag. <laughs> I'm good. We were talking doing about doing? doing just great. We were we were just discussing uh, why World War One, uh, and it seems to be, as I recall, uh, Jimmy in the in the middle of my screen anyway. Uh, it's probably Sandy's favorite historical picture uh, period, as I recall. Um, That's true. Um, do you have any follow up questions on this one about the World War One? question specifically or do you want to just wait and see how things go uh i'll let sandy ask for herself when she, she'll be here in a couple of minutes okay uh, so neil i have a i have a question and forgive me i haven't read uh read the book yet it's on order from uh, alice but um 
in, in terms of your investigations and studies, of course, the topical question is the Spanish flu. And what aspects did that um, reveal itself in terms of your uh, studies, your investigations, and, and uh, how did that color the times? Sure, uh, that's a good question. I just want to add something about the World War I before I sort of venture onto that. I will say that, that I think one of the reasons that there's, you know, of, of late a lot more, not of late for, for a lot while now, a lot more World War II stories is because of the availability of people to interview and veterans right. who, you know, are sort of uh, passing on. And so, you know, historians like, like me and, and, and others, you know, they had the availability of these first person interviews of World War II. And so I think that was, was a compelling reason to, to venture in there because you really do get the opportunity to meet these people, uh, to ask them, you know, how they were thinking, how they were feeling, uh, what, what, what the scenes looked like, everything, um, which makes for, can make for a much more visceral, much more present um, narrative. And so I think that's one of the reasons that World War II uh, has sort of been more to the fore. Um, Narish, just to sort of answer your question about the, the Spanish flu, in a lot of these camps, and, and particularly in Holtzman, and um, in late, which is Holtzman and is, you know, because you haven't read the book, Holtzman and is the, is the site uh, or the camp uh, that was an officer's camp that was kind of the place where the Germans put the worst of the worst. Uh, and by the worst, I mean uh, British soldiers and various other Commonwealth soldiers uh, who were known escape artists and kept breaking out of places. And so they needed a, a sort of Alcatraz in Germany. And so Holtzman and was that. Um, in really before my events take place, because the, the breakout is really in the sort of summer of 1918, but post that, um, th there was a number of people beginning to get sick um, in, in the course of, of the summer. But as things sort of sped along into late 1918 and then into 19, 1919, uh, there were a number of, of, of soldiers and prisoners at the camp who were suffering um, from uh, the Spanish flu. And, and particularly in, in uh, rank and file soldiers. Um, those camps were much more crowded and so the spread of the disease was much worse, which, which actually prompted a lot of, lot of sort of desperate escape attempts uh, to get out of those camps. But particularly in Escape Artist, my book, that wasn't really a motivation in, by the summer of 1918, but it was subsequently to subsequent uh, escapes. And so you, you do find that the numbers of attempted escapes uh, accelerate pretty quickly in uh, late 18, 1918 and early 1919. Hmm. One of the other things I think I'm, I read, I can't remember where I read it actually, because you were talking about um, the difference in how they treated the officers mm -hmm. at the camp and how they were allowed to even take a break outside the camp and take a walk. Um, my assumption is that dramatically changed between World War I and World War II. Yeah, it, it, was, it was another reason that I um, was interested in, in writing about these camps because the culture was so strange uh, or strange to someone who knows, you know, what World War II camps were like. So these World War I camps, particularly the officers camps, um, it was a little bit of a kind of upstairs, downstairs uh, situation where the officers uh, were allowed to take a walks of, called parole walks. Uh, around the countryside, they would sign a piece of paper that said that they promised not to escape and they would be let out the gates uh, for a walk in the countryside and then they would come back. Um, and by wow. virtue of their promise not to escape, that that, that was the nature. Um, they had individuals who would cook their meals and shine their boots. Um, they were allowed packages uh, from home. They were allowed, you know, tin biscuits and nice clothes and, um, you know, in some cases wine and various other things shipped from, uh, from family and friends. And so it was kind of this strange world uh, that predated what you would, what they would have experienced in World War II. Now, 
what was particularly about Holtzminden was that Niemeyer, who was the commandant, was particularly cruel. And so a lot of those advantages that these officers had uh, were limited there. And that became another uh, impetus for the escape. They were not um, given any respect or anything along those lines. And so they sort of took it as, a, as you know, they should be able to escape because they're not being treated like officers. Any follow-up questions, folks? Well, I have a yeah, go ahead. Sort, of, <clears throat> sort of separate question, but um, related to that in that one of the things that we loved about the book when we were reading it for the History Book Group was that you had lots of pictures <laughs> included. And I wondered whether you had people help, you know, research and finding those images, whether you were doing it all yourself, whether and how it must have been sort of exciting going through the photographs and, and deciding what to use and unfortunately having to cull probably, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, you know, I was kind of surprised about the, the amount of photographs that were available um, for these camps. And I will say, and this is not a plug for the young adult book, but um, the young adult book is called Grand Escape and it has probably three times the amount of photographs in there. So I was actually able to draw on a lot more of these um, various memorabilia and um, there were cartoons. I mean, these camps had newspapers. Um, they had almost uh, yearbooks in, in some cases. They had theater societies. Uh, they had uh, reading groups just like this one. Um, wow. And, but uh, there were uh, just, I was worried when I first started it, uh, doing the research, about the amount of material that would be available. Now I knew, of course, that, that the, the British archives had a lot of prisoner of war accounts, but uh, I didn't know the level of, of personal diaries, personal photographs that were available until, you know, I got about three months of research into London and, and at these various sort of smaller libraries and archives, I began finding uh, these prisoner accounts and their, their archives that had been donated. And they just had a wealth of photographs there. I mean, they had camp photographers in some cases. Um, they had uh, the British government and various other people would come in and take photographs to make sure everyone was okay. Um, this was not Holtzman, but other places. So you did have this just great wealth of photographs. And then, of course, you had a lot of the photographs of the, particularly of the RFC, uh, the different kinds of planes and, and, and the units and, and everything. So it was a challenge to try to, to decide uh, what to include and not include. Similarly, it was a challenge to decide, you know, what characters to focus on, or what individuals to focus on because there, there was just such a rich array of different personalities uh, of, of these soldiers and, and pilots that in many cases it became, you know, I probably could have written three books about this escape. Um, I'm glad I didn't, but I think one is enough. But there was, there was just a wealth of material and the families provided a lot as well. I tracked down a lot of the different families, um, you know, great grandchildren, great nieces, whatever, uh, and they had photographs and, and, and scrapbooks and, and diaries as well. So it was pretty, pretty wonderful. Jimmy, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to ask a question about the characters. When you're talking about the characters, my favorite character in the book was Harvey. Now, Harvey wasn't a pilot, and he didn't even escape with the rest of the people. So you gave him a lot of attention and I was curious about why was that? Was it because of he was such a character that you had to include him in the story or yeah. what was going through your mind? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it's kind of strange, right? Because he's not a part of the, of the group of people who escape. And I similarly uh, to you was fascinated by him. I thought he was such a, a rounded character. 
And I, I ended up choosing to focus on him largely because he was the most eloquent about what it was like to be a prisoner and the most eloquent about what that did to the psyche and what the experience of being a prisoner of war, particularly at Holtzmann, did. Uh, how the passage of time, um, you know, sort of corrupted his soul, corrupted his mind, rotted him. Uh, he had beautiful poetry about that. And so, you know, a lot of the diaries that you find, particularly for individuals like David Gray, who you might consider the hero of the story, are very matter of fact, are very what happened, the, the, what hap how he went from A to B, how they dug the tunnel, uh, you know, important details, but not sort of a window onto the soul of who these people were. And I thought Harvey provided that. And I, I agree, that was good. And his, his archives were just so extensive. Like, I mean, he, I had access to all his notebooks, of course, he wrote um, two, two books about his experience at, at Holtzminden, uh, diaries, everything. So it was just, I felt like it was too good of an opportunity to pass up. And I think without Harvey, the book would have had less of an insight into the prisoner life. That's good. Yeah, I agree too. I liked him the best. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to use more of his poetry. Uh, <laughs> I love World War I poetry, so it was probably, you know, uh, another reason that I probably selected him. I'm well, curious. I, oh, go ahead, Rich. Go ahead. I'm curious if, if uh, w what if any reaction you've gotten from Germans to the book? You know, I haven't, for this particular one, you know, World War I, I, I get a lot of comments. Um, when I write about World War II, I've written a couple books about World War II and I get more correspondence related to that. Some of it's crazy stuff um, from neo-Nazis. Uh, oh, other good. Kind of, uh, is, you know, um, people, you know, writing glad that I've brought up a particular subject. I feel like I just don't get that kind of, um, or I didn't when I wrote Escape Artists um, from, from Germany or elsewhere. You know, I got a, a couple of, of, of nice reviews, but that was really all the experience that I had with it. I think there's just the nature of, you know, to go back to Alice's first question, like the difference between writing about World War I and World War II is, 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 is pretty, pretty wide. Well, one of the points that you also made, um, and again, it may have been a question that was raised on your website also, was the impact that um, Holtzminden had after the war. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit because I didn't quite understand what you meant. Okay, so I'll just, I'll, I'll bring up the story of another one of my favorite people in, in the book, and that's uh, Jim Bennett. Jim Bennett was a uh, observer pilot. Uh, he was downed uh, in the North Sea uh, he was one of the one of the individuals who escaped from Holtzman and uh, through the tunnel. And in World War II, shortly before World War II started, uh, he was approached by um, the intelligence services of, of, of the British uh, and asked to lecture about his experiences uh, escaping. Because in World War One, there was no preparation, no training, no supplies uh, for anyone um, when it came to escape. So, you know, if you were a soldier or you were a pilot, I mean, they weren't even giving you parachutes, right? <laughs> so, because they didn't want to, um, they didn't want you to be less aggressive if they knew that you could, um, you know, uh, throw yourself out of the plane and, and land safely. So, there just was, just no preparation for it. So the consequence of that was very few escapes in World War I. A lot more people um, captured, never, never got out. And the people who did attempt, they were recaught um, 
recaptured um, at a very high rate. And so in World War II, shortly before it started, um, some of the people in the intelligence service decided that, that they needed to change things and, and they needed to provide training, provide supplies, and that includes everything from, uh, you know, uh, compasses to uh, rations uh, to, to have uh, to, uh, to training about how to escape and evade if you're shot down over enemy territory. And so when I talked about what the consequence of Holtzman was, was that these people became the professors of escape in, be, during and throughout World War II, not only for the British, uh, but then the Americans came over too and afterwards launched their escape and evasion service, which is still taught today. And so you find in World War II, because of that training, because they were prepared, because men like Jim Bennett spent World War II going from uh, airfield to airfield training uh, pilots and lecturing on how to escape, that the, the percentages of downed airmen in World War II who escaped and made it back to safe territory are astronomically higher uh, than World War I. So, so, so okay. it just saved, you know, I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of lives. You seem to be enamored of escape stories. <laughs> and I, what fascinates you about them? I mean, I find them incredible. I, it, you know, anytime there's that kind of a movie on TV or a book like that, I've uh, automatically, you know, I, I really love them. So I just didn't know what, what sort of got you, got you hooked. Well, I think, you know, I've always, I've always been drawn to, to, you know, and maybe it's because I'm uh, of my short stature, but I've always been drawn to David and Goliath stories. Uh, and, you know, a prison story is basically, you know, prison escape story is exactly that. Um, I would also say that I was, I've, I've watched uh, Clint Eastwood's Escape from Alcatraz probably oh, yeah. 40 times. I mean, I just was enamored by it, the, the, the sequence, the ingenuity that it took, the patience, uh, and, and, you know, of course, Shawshank Redemption, all these sort of movies. And then I read a lot of those uh, books of World War II Escape, uh, The Wooden Soldier and, and, and various others. And then, you know, while researching this book, I became, I thought there was a lot of uh, World War II literature about escape, but the amount of World War I literature about escape is, yeah. is crazy. Um, and there's some really wonderful um, books uh, about World War I escape um, that were written, you know, in the early 20s by a number of these people who, who escaped. And I, I'm trying to, I mean, just off the top of my head, I can't think of, of one that'll come to me in a second, but uh, I used a lot of them and you can find them in the, in the bibliography because they really do paint a picture of what life was like. And, and they also teach the art of escape uh, in those as well. So they'll give you uh, t how to tunnel, um, how to build a false wall, how to, uh, you know, uh, forge a key, uh, how to make a, a fake pass. I mean, Everything that you would not want to know, um, you can find in these books uh, that, that were published. Um, I'm very interested in knowing because, of course, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking of Steve McQueen's movie, The Great Escape. And I'm thinking, this is the movie, <laughs> basically, except in World War I. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come upon this story? Yeah, so I was saying this at the beginning. So uh, the, my editor uh, at Scholastic suggested I write about The Great Escape. And I, I was not interested in really doing a World War I story. And so I came across the story of Holtzman, and which, and I didn't mention this before, is, was the, you know, the blueprint for how, these, uh, how the, the Great Escape, the Steve McQueen, uh, you know, people, uh, they learned how, what to do and how to escape that camp in World War II from these World War I Holtzman and people. Uh -huh. So 
they were not only inspired by it, but they would have known the story, they would have been lectured to, uh, they would have, you know, it would have, they would have known. And so there's, there's a very obvious reason why the Great Escape of World War II mimics the Holtzman and is because they copied it almost wholesale uh, from, from these uh, soldiers and, and pilots and, and at Holtzman. And, your comments before about Jim Bennett, I found that's one of the interesting things I found out about the book because when you think of wartime or the military, you're not thinking that everybody's taking a class in like Escape 101, you know? Um, and yet, you know, reading about Bennett's experiences after, you know, the war, during World War II and even afterwards, uh, was really kind of fascinating to think that they're actually having classes on how to escape, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and no, I mean, I had his, you know, and it's, I think it's, it's in the book too. Like I had his lecture notes, um, you know, and his, his daughter and son had no idea, you know, he would, they thought he was just in the import export business and he would leave, you know, on weekends or during the week and take a train and they wouldn't see him for a couple of days. And he was secretly going to all these airfields. Um, he developed one of the first uh, um, compasses that, could be uh, stitched in as a button, button compasses. And uh, so, you know, he was, he was pretty wonderful. And his children didn't know this until, you know, after his death, um, where they uh, opened a trunk and found all this information about what he had done. That's, sort of mind, that's mind boggling to think that you would find that out about your parent like have no idea what they did for a living and to find this out after they were gone is just, I mean, I, I sort of feel for them, you know, it must've been hard in some way, sort of exciting, but also sort of hard for them to realize that he was never telling us the truth about what he was doing. I had a friend of mine, I have a friend of mine here who saw Joe Newton, who found out that his mother had been a spy when huh. she died, had no idea. Wow, fascinating. You've been a spy during the war. Yeah, I mean, the Bennett's daughter, who I spent a fair bit of time with in England, um, you know, her reaction to it was, her reaction to it was more, he had to keep a secret. So it wasn't something that, that he did for no reason. Yeah. And I mean, I've rarely met someone more proud of her. <laughs> What her father had done uh, and his experiences because you know you can imagine the kind of life he he had right i mean he not only uh, participated in this uh the biggest escape of world war one uh but then subsequently worked for mi9 uh and probably helped save you know as i said you know hundreds of, of lives just from his lectures alone yeah. i'm glad well, that speaking that, about that how many how, did, did you have a lot of pushback from any of the family members as you were trying to do your research or were most of them happy to engage with you and talk about their their family's experiences this was this was one of those fortunate ones where they they were just so happy right i mean someone to be calling you know from out of the blue or sending them an email and saying did you you know and a few of them only had a vague idea of of, of what their you know great grandfather had, had, had done Mm. Uh, and his involvement. I mean, I didn't, not everyone that I reached out to was, had successfully escaped Holtzman and many of them, I just had been prisoners there and I wanted to know what the experience was, was so that I could paint that scene of what it was like to live in these camps. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of going into attics and going into basements and, and going into old trunks and, and pulling stuff up. But I'd say almost, I, Everyone was very enthusiastic uh, to help. And, uh, you know, I couldn't have written the book without them. I mean, particularly, for instance, you know, Jim Bennett. I mean, his daughter gave me so much great material. Um, and, you know, his recollections of, of how he escaped and particularly how he was on the run uh, were, were, you know, critical. Even the fact that there there was so much information, there were books written, there were memoirs, or all kinds of stuff. Like this, we saw a lot of it in in your acknowledgments. <coughs> Given that, when and how did you know that you had a unique story to tell? 
Yeah, I, I was, you know, you find these stories and you just can't believe that, that, that 20 other people have <laughs> written them, right? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, and this isn't to plug faster either, but like the story of faster, like that just seems, you know, a Jewish race car driver taking on the German silver arrows right before World War II. It just seems like the book that someone else should have written. Um, but for one reason or another, uh, the, the story sort of hid away. And we can start talking about faster now. Thank you, because I have questions about it. Well, wait, let's hear the end of okay. this. I'm yes. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Neil. <laughs> so, so sometimes you just get lucky. And, the, you know, I think there were one or two other books about Holtzmann, but they were so, uh, they were written a long time ago. They were very dry, very different kind of history um, than, than the kind of history that I try to write, which is more narrative driven. Everything's true, but it's sort of, you, you're trying to make it read like a, a novel. Uh, and so no one had sort of ventured in that territory. So as soon as I find those stories, I, I'm pretty quick about uh, getting them into the pipeline because, you know, I've, I've found other stories where I was like, that's genius. And then um, I send it to my, you know, publisher or my agent or, and editor and they're like, oh, someone just sold that book uh, oh, no. last week or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, you know, it happens. So... Do you do all your own research or do you have like research assistants or? Yeah, so I always hire people. Uh, generally, I will have, for instance, uh, on escape artists, I had a couple of researcher, a researcher in Germany and a researcher in England. And that's by virtue of the fact that I, you know, I've, well, not so young children anymore, but teenagers. Um, and so I can't do what I used to do, you know, my first couple of books when I wasn't married and I didn't have children where I could, you know, go to Australia for six months and, and research. I just can't do that anymore. So okay. I will, I will go initially, um, do, do the sort of initial sort of looking in, where should I be looking? Um, then I will send, uh, my researchers to find everything that, that, is sort of on the very readily available. I'll read that and then I'll, I'll guide them on different areas to, to search subsequent to that. And then I'll make a second trip where I um, hoover up more information as well. So, you know, most of my books are, are not based in the United States. So I, I need that kind of help. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's, it's wonderful. And I, I, I love doing it because writing can be a very lonely occupation. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's nice to be able to have a, have a team. Thank you. So you also wrote Nazi Hunters, which as a middle school librarian is always checked out of the library, which is like why I have to apologize for not having read it because it's, always checked out of the library and I think like all three copies are, are living at home happily with with kids as they're quarantining but how did that pension for like the love of escape stories and that right I mean this that's in like many ways an opposite of escape stories yeah so Nazi hunters you know Nazi hunters came from my adult book was called hunting Eichmann about the the capture of Eichmann um, and then that was actually the first book that Scholastic and I worked together to, to transition for the middle grade young, young adult audience. Um, that was, you know, again, I, I can't tell you exactly sort of what drew my interest to doing the sort of converse of that, other than saying that, you know, I was, the motivation for that book was, and that book is about the, uh, the hunt and capture of Adolf Eichmann in 1960. Uh, in Argentina uh, by the Mossad. Um, and in college, I was, uh, when I was living overseas in Luxembourg, I w needed to make extra money, so I would walk dogs uh, for people uh, in the, the neighborhood that I was living. And one of the, one of my clients uh, was, it turned out to be a, a survivor. And um, she, told me over, you know, tea one day that she had never spoken about what happened to her until uh, Eichmann was captured 
uh, and, and in particular the trial. And so I remember I, that always sort of stuck with me and, and it was reminded to me by a friend who I had told that story to. And uh, he's like, you know, you should, you should write about the story of Eichmann. I mean, it was a, it's a great spy story, but it has such this enormous social and justice impact, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, how that book came about. If that answers, does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm sorry. So. Yeah, I was just curious to what, you know, with the love of escape stories, what would draw you to compellingly telling the other side of the story? And right. I, I, I will say that I was informed by that, you know, I wrote Honey, uh, Nazi Hunters First, so I had a very good view on what people do to, to hunt people down. Um, uh -huh. And particularly on the, the after these, after the prisoners at Holtzman had escaped and then they're on the run, that sort of period of time was, it, it was a lot of fun to take it from the, from the escapee's point of view. Yeah. Thank you. Bet. Everybody ready to jump to World War II? No. <laughs> no? Go ahead. Go ahead and ask. Is that a yes, Nancy, or is that a Sandy? Yeah, a I um, I have I bought the book for my husband. For, this is faster, faster for Father's okay. Day because, of course, I read the, your, uh, you know, the escape artists, and it was fascinating. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit, maybe, about your understanding of race car driving in the 30s in France because I read a book by Francine Prose. I don't know if you're aware of it. Chameleon Cub, 1932. Do you know this book? I know. No, I do not. I, know, I mean, I know Francine Prose. Okay. And that was about a, um, well, it was a novel. Okay. So, but it was loosely or not loosely, but based on uh, the life of a woman by the name of Violette Morris, who mm -hmm. was the first uh, female race car driver. And apparently, this was very a very big thing in mm -hmm. the 30s. Of course, Violette ended up going over to the Nazis and becoming a um, uh, well-known torturer, unfortunately. But um, in any case, you know, talk a little. Bit, can you talk a little bit about that culture of the um, race car issues? Well, can we circle back to that after after Neil just describes the book because it's brandy spanking new and a lot of people don't know about it. Okay. And this group may may be more informed than others because I put it on my newsletters, but I just thought it would be nice to have Neil introduce it. Sure. Uh, I mean, the, the, the kind of elevator pitch of, of Faster is it's, uh, well, as my wife says, it's the Jesse Owens story of, of, of race car driving. Mm -hmm. so, Somebody has yeah. already compared that, made that comparison here with the book. Oh, yeah. That's okay. great. Tell your wife she gets a gold star. <laughs> uh, so, she, you know, it's the it's this story of, of, of Rene Dreyfus, who was uh, born in Nice. Uh, his father was Jewish, his mother was Catholic. He didn't really subscribe to one religion or the other. Racing was his religion. And he uh, in, you know, grew up loving cars, grew up driving, um, did a bunch of sort of races in the hills around Nice in the, in the 20s, but always wanted to be a, a Grand Prix race car driver. And so in 1930, he found himself in a, in a Bugatti, uh, drove at the, uh, Monte Carlo Rally, not the Monte Carlo, the Monaco Grand Prix, and won it, and sort of catapulted himself uh, into the to the ranks of, of Grand Prix drivers. And and in the 30s, and I'll sort of answer Nancy's question as I sort of relay a bit of the story. You know, in the in the early 1930s, uh, race car driving, Grand Prix driving, was a very individualistic sport. Uh, these race car drivers uh, were all friends. Uh, they they switched between teams. They would drive for Bugatti or Maserati or Alfa Romeo or Mercedes. Um, whoever had the best car, uh, whoever's team they were invited in, 
And there was, they were this sort of tight knit group of people uh, who were celebrities and, and rich and famous um, uh, and sort of the heroes of, of, of Europe. And Grand Prix was, was one of the biggest sports of, of the time. Of course, um, Hitler comes to power in 1933 and makes it very clear that 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 he wants to do some. He well, he says four things. He wants to revitalize the German automobile industry. He wants to build the autobahn. He wants to create a people's car. And and fourth, but not least important, he wanted to dominate Grand Prix racing because it was a huge propaganda win for the Third Reich. And so the sport of Grand Prix racing becomes something very different uh, in the mid 1930s then. Instead of this independent, uh, it depends on what car you're in, what manufacturer you're in, everyone's friends. It becomes this very siloed uh, sport where uh, it becomes very nationalistic, becomes the French against the Italians, against the Germans. And Mercedes or the Third Reich pumps a just a ton of money uh, into Mercedes and Auto Union and create these cars called Silver Arrows, which were just technologically uh, head over heels <laughs> more advanced than, than any other race cars that had ever uh, hit the racetrack. And so they begin to sweep everything and win everything. And the sport just is dramatically different. It's very nationalistic. It's very bitter rivalries. All these these drivers who were friends become sort of, um, in many respects, enemies. Uh, but for Rene Dreyfus, uh, who was Jewish, um, or that's how people perceived them. Of course, the name Dreyfus is one of the most famous Jewish names uh, in Europe at the time. He's he finds himself banned from from uh, the best teams, from the Germans and the Italians. Uh, and he can't race for a particular French team for a variety of reasons. So he becomes a, a, a kind of jockey without a horse. Uh, he has no car to drive. And this is by 1935, 36. And so the story of Faster uh, chronicles not only Rene's sort of life as a race car driver, but also uh, this German driver, Rudy Caracciola, who um, had a terrible accident, lost his wife, and became the great driver for Mercedes. And then, and then follows their story until 1936, where Lucy Shell, uh, who was an American heiress, um, she was like uh, Violette Morris, one of the early speed queens, one of the early female race car drivers, uh, mostly uh, rally drivers, long distance rally drivers. She decides for a variety of reasons that she's gonna start her own Grand Prix racing team because she wants to take on the Germans because no one else will. Um, and so she spends her fortune on, um, on building a Grand Prix race car from scratch. Uh, and the only driver who doesn't have a, a team is Rene. And so she recruits Rene. And so the story of Faster is about Rene, Lucy, and this almost bankrupt uh, French automaker called Delahaye, which builds this car. And the story is them taking on the Silver Arrows uh, at the start of the 1938 Grand Prix. Um, and of course, I wouldn't have written it if they didn't, they, 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 they cleaned up. Um, Thank you, I needed a good ending now. <laughs> so, you know, not all stories end badly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean that's that's that, that's the pretty broad brush strokes of, of, of that story. Mm. Nancy, does that answer your question about, yes. about you, well sure because it was very important at that time. Uh, you know, with Violette Morris, uh, she was basically recruited by the Nazis to be running races, but then she kind of went off into an even more dark place with them. But um, in essence, yes, that's, um, that's kind of what, um, what happened. It's a great book, you should read it. I will. It's, and just on the other side of that, um, there were a number of these French uh, Grand Prix drivers, not Rene, because Rene um, had to escape France um, because of the, you know, his victories escaped France and joined the, the American army and, 
and was, you know, uh, part of the, uh, uh, the forces that landed in Italy and, and helped free Europe. I mean, he lived quite a life too. Uh, but there were some, some of his peers in the French Grand Prix racing uh, scene uh, became spies uh, for the British uh, on the side of the resistance. And um, several of them were captured by the Germans and, and killed. Um, and one of the two of them sur survived it. And they have a, a tremendous uh, story as well about, uh, you know, participating in the resistance on the opposite side of, of Violet Morris. I just think it's interesting that uh, you don't read much about uh, how Grand Prix racing was uh, perceived at that time, which you did answer because it became nationalistic, where originally it was just, you know, individuals. Exactly. Um, yeah, and, um, and it was a very big thing in France. And the other, the other part that was important, and you know, this maybe gets a little bit deeper, is, is it wasn't just about propaganda either. Of course, it, you know, sport has nationalistic you know, importance and prominence. The, the Olympics are paired just with Grand Prix racing. Like you could say they're, they're of the same thing. Uh, the difference with the Grand Prix and the difference with um, particularly why the Germans were so interested and Hitler was so interested and this I didn't even know until I had already committed to writing the book, but it just made it such, uh, you know, the story so much more important. Uh, so Hitler wanted not only to uh, win the Grand Prix for propaganda, but he wanted these German race car drivers to be heroes and to be idols because he wanted to recruit um, people to join what was called the NSKK, which was a organization, a paramilitary organization uh, akin to the SS or, or others, uh, but its, its sort of focus was on recruiting drivers and mechanics and people um, who could learn uh, how, to, how to deal with motors, how to drive cars, how to drive trucks. And so the success of the German uh, race car teams uh, uh -huh. caused hundreds of thousands of young men uh, to join the NSKK and learn about cars and learn cool. how to drive. And those people served um, as the basis uh, for the recruitment of, uh, you know, the motorized infantry um, that participated, wow. of course. Oh, in, wow. Very wow, smart. yeah, that's very and everything else. So, you know, these things came hand in hand. And I, uh, third and, and not least, um, a lot of the supercharged engines that Mercedes was building for these Grand Prix race cars, the same technology that was used in those were used in the Luftwaffe. So really, about more than just uh, a lot more than just about sport. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was successful. I mean, I have to, you know, um, in you know, successful in, in that respect. Not that I'm saying it was a good thing. <laughs> you wrote an article um, in, uh, for Lit, well, I read it in LitHub, and I put a copy of the link up here about how you compared writing to uh, making a quilt. And you mentioned your daughter and Martha. Um, in it about how your writing style compared to the patchwork. I, could you just describe it? Because it's a great article. It really, I enjoyed it a lot. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, my Martha, since we're on a small Zoom group, is her real name is Julia. So <laughs> I won't confuse you. Um, so she, you know, uh, learned, she's 12 now, but learned from my mother how to quilt. Uh, and I do remember them getting together and going searching for, for different fabric, different patchwork fabric to, to uh, sew together. And I was writing this article for Lit Hub and sort of came to that because the, the research of these books is very similar. Like you're just, you're collecting information uh, from everywhere, 
from different people, from different individuals who you may or may not write about. Um, I'll just take faster as an example. Like I probably researched 10 to 12 different race car drivers from that period uh, about all their lives, about how they become drivers, about what teams they drove for, what the cars were like, um, everything from newspaper articles to magazine articles to archival information uh, to photographs. Uh, did the same thing with all these different race courses, Monaco, uh, you know, the uh, Monza, various other ones all sort of taking all this information and not really sure exactly how it's gonna fit together or what I'm gonna use. Um, but just spending a year, or in this case, 18 months, gathering all this information about 1930s racing. Ooh. And then uh, once I'm finished with that gathering, you know, and of course I know what the central story is, but I don't know how it develops, who's gonna be focused on more, who's less, um, and how to paint these scenes. And then I take all those patchworks uh, together and um, sort them, sort through them and, and come up with the structure of, of the book from that. And then, you know, the, the, the writing becomes, as, as I said, sort of a quilting project uh, where I'm, you know, assembling everything exactly where um, I envision it, it should go and the, the end result, you know, researching and writing is, is, is a very similar process in that respect. But I, I describe it a lot better in the, in the essay. It's a great essay. And if you have a chat window open, you, and you can, you can look at it because I put the, the link on the right hand side. I really liked it a lot. Um, what you, you raised something on your website about fun facts. I think I call them tidbits. What tidbits surprised you? in each of the books, what facts that you learned that you just did not see coming? Well, I think for escape artists, um, and I, I did write this on the website, but I, I, when I began writing that book, I wasn't sure, you know, how prominent the RFC would be, you know, how much pro how prominent the pilots would be. Uh, in the story of the escape and sort of finding myself into that world of what it was like to be a Royal Flying Corps pilot uh, in the sort of first real war where air forces were significant uh, was, was fascinating. Ooh. Everything from the training to, to the mortality rates of that uh, was just endlessly fascinating to me. And, you know, David Gray, who was, you know, the hero of the story, he was, you know, he was shot down by Oswald Bulky, who was the sort of uh, the premier uh, German uh, ace. And that was the same flight that the, the, the Red Baron uh, first joined um, a dogfight. So it was just this, these little sort of tidbits that, that, you know, you find coursing through the research and no one had ever sort of tied those things, two things together. And that, that, was, that was fun, fun to do. Um, with faster, I would say, you know, part of it was the NSKK and how important racing was actually to the war effort rather than just a propaganda, um, scheme. And mm. I, think, I think the second thing that I would say about the, the racing book is, and perhaps one of the more fun aspects of writing that book was, was getting to drive in these cars. Um, particularly, <laughs> oh, really? Particularly <laughs> the LA 145. And I've never inserted myself into, into one of my books before, but I start, uh, I start faster with, with myself in a Delahaye 145 sort of racing through the orange groves of California because the experience is so absolutely terrifying uh, <laughs> at 70 miles an hour. And these guys were going 150 miles an hour <gasps> in an open topped, uh, I mean, the wheels are super narrow. I mean, I felt like I was going to go into a, a ditch or spin or a hurdle or, or whatever at any moment. And they were doing double the speed on very tight, windy courses with, uh, you know, crowded with other cars. Uh, and you hopefully get a, a real sense of, of what madmen they were and how brave they were and, and, and how 
dangerous <laughs> the sport was. And I would say that uh, another sort of tidbit of a sad one is, is that racing in the 1930s was really, really, really dangerous. I mean, you know, Formula One driving now or NASCAR driving, you know, you occasionally will have pretty bad crashes. Occasionally someone will, will die. Um, back in the 1930s, you would expect every weekend or every other weekend for, for someone to die. Uh, oh, my. The uh, they and, had to be totally fearless to do this. Totally fearless. And so, that, so, so to your point, you know, the discussions about how, what they talked about in terms of like how they faced death uh, on a weekly basis and how they dealt with it. Um, and, you know, the description of like winning a race, uh, you had to sort of bump up against death in order to be the fastest on the course, because oh. you had to push, you had to take that certain line that others wouldn't be willing to take uh, in order to win. Um, just, you know, from a just purely human level was, was really interesting to me. Neil, do you think that there are lessons that we should be learning from the history in either one of these books? I think that, you know, the lessons from Faster, I think, you know, uh, particularly today, whether, you know, regardless of your p political affiliation or, or, or not, um, you know, is the story of Lucy Shell, right? So Lucy uh, despised the Germans, uh, despised what the, the Third Reich, despised the philosophy, um, wanted to fight against it, wanted to push back, wanted to sort of show that the, the Germans weren't the best in everything always. And so she took that fight in the arena in which she could take it, and that was in motorsport. Um, and so, you know, she sort of, she, she made her opposition known in that particular field where she, where she lived. And I think that, you know, similar to, uh, to what all of us, you know, can do. And I've said this in speeches to, to, to high schools is like, you know, not everyone can be a national leader. Not everyone can be the president or the, or a political candidate, the head of a party. But we all live in our communities. We all can can do things in in the worlds in which we live. Um, and I think you know, I think that's what Lucy did. That's the stand that she took. And I think that's hopefully what other people are are inspired by. That's certainly what you know, particularly the the racers, which is the young adult version of of faster. That's a, a point I make very uh, clear. So there is a young adult version of the same story. Yeah, it's called The Racers, and it will be out in, uh, I think, October. That's good to know. September, October, I'm not, I'm not sure. Do you envision yourself ever, I mean, what's the word from the publishing world about getting back on the road? Is there any, I mean, is everything on permanent hold all over the country? Yeah, I don't think I'm I, going. It, I, I know I have. You know, the, the Jewish Book Council does um, tours for authors who re have writing about, you know, specific Jewish related content. And right. generally that happens in the fall. And, and generally you go to 15 cities in like two weeks. It's nuts. And uh, I think that's going to be virtual. I mean, that's, that's what they're sort of leading it to be. So I would hope so. A lot of, a lot of the conferences that I had for this fall are already moving into virtual. I will I mean, say for everyone sort of on the line here, I'm happy to send you um, signed book plates if you I want. I have, I've you just have run them? out, oh, so I would love some ahead. more. Uh, if you want some more, I'm happy to send you more. Please, because we are selling your book. We love it. And it was a, it came just in time for Father's Day and it just turned out to be this wonderful, you know, it filled a great niche for people who really wanted history and it's, it's active and it's got, it's just, it, it pushed a lot of really great buttons. And I really got one for my that. husband for Father's Day. I told you, Alice, Alice posted a picture of the table. And I was actually going out to be like, I need to find something for my husband for Father's Day. And I looked at my po at your post and was like, that's it. I'm sold. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there'll be more there at, at, at Alice. I'll send you more.
Thank you, Neil. I appreciate now, it. Now, Neil, because you know you're not on the road right now, I'm I'm assuming you probably have a little more time to devote to your next endeavor. Is there anything you can tell us about any upcoming projects you have? Yeah, so my next book is actually going to be an original um, young adult book, uh, which I've never done. Um, and so it's going to be nonfiction. It's going to be about Gandhi's salt march um, in 1930, which was the first, um, you know, is uh, Gandhi's first major nonviolent movement uh, in India. Uh, and it was, you know, a combination of between very violent and very inspiringly uh, um, nonviolent on, on his end. And so it's, it's sort of the encapsulation of the Gandhi story in this one um, scene in, okay. in, in the 1930s. And it's, uh -huh. um, it's really terrific. And it was the inspiration for uh, all the marches that we, we see today, uh, as well as Martin Luther King and, and others. How on earth did you find this subject? I'm I'm like a Gandhi crazy person. I don't know why. What made you decide to go young adult with this book first instead of? I, that's a great question. Um, mostly because, well, two reasons. One, it, books on India for the adult market are tough. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, and two, I. I, I, and most importantly is, is I wanted to write it for kids. And by kids, I mean seventh grade, so seventh to 11th grade. So I'm not dumbing down the writing at all. Um, but I wanted to tell a sort of very focused narrative uh, that has this really sort of compelling message to it. Um, and I just felt like its impact was more for uh, you know, young adults than it was for, for us. Is Scholastic picking it up? Yeah, Scholastic's doing it. Okay. So what, what are some, since, since this one is one that you're doing just for YA, what are some of the challenges that you found with this as opposed to the ones that you adapted to YA from books that you had already written? So I think, you know, the challenge for me is you know, on an adult book, I will spend two to three years, right? And I will, as I was saying about, you know, equating it to quilting is like, there's no information that I won't go after. There's no archive I won't hunt down. There's no interview I won't try to get. Um, I just, I, I know that I need everything I can ever get uh, to, to write the best book possible. And I think for the young adult book, a, it's about a third of the length of, a, of an adult book. So I just, from a pure like wasted effort standpoint, I'm just trying to figure out like, what do I need to tell this story uh, without spending three years on it, which I just can't do for, you know, I don't think it's necessary and I don't think it's not financially uh, prudent. Um, and so, how much original research do I need to do versus, I mean, you could, there's so many books written on Gandhi that I, I would never have to leave a library and I could write this book, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to do that. Like, I want to do original research. I want to find well, stuff. Well, now's not a good time to go to India. Right. Yeah. I want to find stuff um, <laughs> that other people haven't written, but like, how much of that do I need? And so I'm doing this like real balancing act of, of, of effort versus what's necessary um, and what I need to do to, to, to write the book effectively. So you sort of have to funnel it down to... Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot more, it's gonna be a challenge, which is, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing it. Um, Cause yeah, I- don't you find that when people really are passionate about something that shows in their writing, I mean, no matter what their skills are, the passion for the subject itself really does show in the final product, I believe. Yeah, it's interesting because I had a friend who just finished faster and he said, uh, I could tell you were just into this one, <laughs> right? And I'm not going to say which book he, he said I wasn't into, um, but... <laughs> 
But he's like, I just didn't feel that with that book X. But this was one, he right? Uh, but he was right. <laughs> he was right. Um, and I think Gandhi. I've been yeah. I've been researching this for, since uh, gosh, uh, 2012. So I, you know, oh, I thought yeah. I was going to do an adult book on it, and I just kept trying to figure out like how to make it work, and it just I wanted to write it. For a different audience and so that's what i'm doing and when can we expect that <laughs> i'm ready everything's shut like uh you can't oh. you know all these the, all the british archives uh the archives in india are all shuttered mm -hmm. so for very good reason they're having a lot of problems reason. over there so, but the, also the book industry even if you had it ready right now I have to tell you, all of these books that were supposed to come out in March and April are coming out in September yeah. and October. So how do I filter that? Right. How do I begin to, I mean, the printing presses in, in China, that there are five of them. There's only three of them operational. I think one of them may have opened back up. So, and then everybody that was supposed to get stuff printed now, Everything was pushed to the side to pull out all the Black Lives Matters title and reprint them. Mm -hmm. So then all of the factories and all of the and all of the publishing houses and all the distribution centers and all the UPS uh, warehouses, everyone's social distancing. So add two days to everything, at least. Yeah. It was add two weeks to everything. There's, I mean, my, I'll give you a scholastic story really quickly. I sent an order into Scholastic on the 15th of May. It was submitted to Scholastic on the 16th of June because my rep was furloughed. Oh, yeah. Wow. I didn't know. Amazing. Well, I just, so that's happening in little pockets right, places, everywhere. you know. Yeah. And so the fact that your book came in at this time, this well, I got the book plates. It was perfect timing for us. And we're little, but I've sold a bunch of them. And it's, it's because it hits a note right now where people are fighting a good fight and there's a good cause. And I think people need to hear that things turn out okay for people and that there are people willing to sort of lay it down and, and you know, have something righteous to work for. Just going back to when things are coming out, I had just read an arc and went in to see you and said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. This said on the arc that it was going to come out and May, and you told in May, the end of May or something. And you told me, oh, no, now it's been pushed back to September. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're. So you got in under the deadline. I mean, <laughs> it, as, as difficult as it is to come out in the middle of a pandemic, there is focus now because people had time to look for it and find mm. it. In the fall, if it had been bumped to the fall, you would have been lost in a blur. Yeah. Right. So just cons actually consider yourself lucky in some ways <laughs> and that you're yeah, not out on the road yeah. getting sick. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I remember debating with my publisher when to come out with this book, just based on what the political situation would be like. You know, with the with the, the democratic uh, you know process, and then the the presidential campaign. I mean, it's a bit of a crapshoot whenever you come out. So it is a pandemic and a presidential election years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, now, re now, we're ready to jettison 2020 for some of those reasons. Yes. Mm -hmm. Coming out now, though, in uh, with the Bubba Wallace uh, controversy in NASCAR, you know, there's there's certainly some elements there that uh, are similar. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point, and you know, that that's I'm glad you brought it up because I was supposed to email my publicist today about that, uh, and I haven't, but they. You know, I think there's probably but some... to draw a correlation. Yeah, for sure. I think it well, happens definitely. organically. I think, you know, the publicist ought to be putting it in the emails that we get. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I mean, there's there's chunks of occasions where this can fit in really well. So I think that it's it's really fit a good niche at a good time as long as as 
you know, it, it keeps making those lists, you'll do just fine. I mean, HMH has been really kind to a lot of bookstores and independent bookstores, HMH has really stepped up their game and said, we're doing this for you and we're making this available for you. So they are wonderful to deal with. I really okay. have enjoyed dealing with them. That's good to hear. Scholastic notes. Neil, uh, <laughs> if, if I may, uh, uh, somebody asked a question about uh, uh, how'd you get into the uh, faster? And I, I think that when you made a statement that um, this is one of your your books that you were totally into it. And I think it's my feeling is you experienced it in that in that race car. Mm. You got when you when you got in that race car and you said, I'm going 70 miles an hour, and you're thinking about the other guy that's going double that. Mm. Uh, the sensation will carry you right into the book. That's that's my that 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 would be my feeling. Yeah, it was. You know, I I have to. I will admit, we got back and I thought we had gone 150 miles an hour, <laughs> and he told me we'd only gone 70, and I was like, no. Oh. <laughs> but uh, it is. You know, I wasn't a car. I. You know, what's interesting is I'm not even. I wasn't before this. I wasn't really a car guy, right? I mean whatever that means, but you know, I, I drive a Subaru. I've never owned a sports car. I don't watch Formula One, but there's just something about the story of Renee. And I think also the story about Lucy uh, that I just love to tell. Like yeah. Lucy, yeah. Lucy was, and I could, I could gush for, for hours about Lucy because she's such, a, such an incredible uh, individual and like uh, I, I couldn't write her poorly because she just she's she jumps off the page. Um, I think too that the the human aspect and we saw this in Escape Artists the human aspect um, is something that you pull in and that's something regardless of you know because I'm anxious to read this um, because I know that you pull in the human aspect. So I'm not a race car person. It's not something that would particularly interest me in terms of racing, mm -hmm. but in terms of the human aspect, knowing your work now, I know this is something I want to read. So. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you. I, as soon as I read the little blurb about it and now hearing you talk about it, it's like, Alice, save me one. Got it. <laughs> So you sold two copies from Alice. Right. Go back. <laughs> Nicely done, Neil. <laughs> and in my in my defense, I didn't bring this up, but uh, my we we moved back to Philadelphia from Seattle. So so this was actually I had a view of Rainier. And so <laughs> this, is my, this is my nostalgia. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so I really appreciate you all uh, zooming in. Um, and listen well, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much I for mean, coming. Thank you. For taking the time Thanks. to talk about your wonderful books. It really, it really makes them come alive in a different way to hear uh, the, the thought processes and the creative influences and where you found your history. And um, it makes a big difference to hear that. And I know that this particular group of people does spread the word when it comes to what they're reading because you'll see us out. You, you can make friends with any one of these people on Facebook and they'll be talking about this. So I really can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you Neil. Really. Definitely. And I'm excited for that Gandhi book. Thank you. I'm happy to come back for the next one. I have yes, one question. Wait, yeah, ben, one what do question, you want to yeah. say? One question. It's off, it's off the subject. Do you okay. still play, do you still play the game? Uh, uh, no, I tried to, tried to start playing again, you know, in an adult league. And I don't think I walk straight for like a minute. <laughs> so I, I, I gave it up, but my, my daughter figure skates, so I All right. I played my last game October. Wow. And I'm, wow. And I'm 80. You're, you're much Bad, more impressive. nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> impressive. So best of luck. And, uh, and I'm, I, will, I will get your faster book. That's awesome. Thanks. Pat. And I did record it. So if anybody wants to see it, do you mind if I share it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. 
I just had to ask. Oh, oh you're asking Neil. <laughs> I had to ask. Neil's the one that, that had, you know, <laughs> reveal, revealed information and, and motivation for us. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, folks, I, good I'm night. Sure. Thank, thank you, you really so much. Everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Thank, thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you. you. Thank you for yeah. joining us. Thank nice you. meeting you, Alice. Nice meeting you too, dear. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alice. Bye. Thanks, Alice. I'll see you soon. You will.